Welcome back to Honored Mad Men, and today we're going to be talking about everybody's favorite Dark Lord, Ganondorf. Many people know him, many people are aware of him, many people even know what he's all about. But how many truly understand Ganondorf, or the cards he was dealt? The man definitely has understandable motives for his actions. That is, if you're willing to accept his reasoning and not assume it's a lie. But to fully get Ganondorf, we have to go back in time to the beginning. So this goes all the way back to the days before even Skyward Sword began. Way back in the day before Hyrule even existed, there was a powerful deity known as Demise. He's sort of like the original demon of the Legend of Zelda universe. And admittedly, he was pretty badass. He had managed to conquer time itself, so that should tell you, uh, well, a great deal about his capabilities. I mean, the dude literally turned himself into a time god. Granted, he was like an evil demon king to begin with, so maybe it wasn't that hard, but still, it's pretty impressive. Anyways, when the Golden Goddesses, that's like the, uh, sort of like the creators of the universe, when they left the world behind, they trusted their ultimate power, the Triforce, you know, the famous Triforce, into the hands of the goddess Hylia to protect it, you know, basically, um, uh, they chose her as their successor. Now, Demise, being Demise, wanted to take the Triforce and therefore the power of the Golden Goddesses for himself in hopes to remake the world in his image, in a way. And to this end, he gathered up an army of horrific monsters and waged an all-out war on the surface, which was what the land that the goddesses created had come to be known as before it became the Hyrule that we know. Understandably, the goddess Hylia and the people of the surface were pretty pissed, and they weren't about to take this one lying down. So Hylia managed to unite the five tribes of the surface, like the Nereverine from Morrowind, and together they fought back against Demise and his horde, defeating him and eventually sealing him away as this monstrous entity known as the Imprisoned, who in my opinion has the coolest design in all of Skyward Sword. Now because Demise is proto-Ganon, he would of course be resurrected sometime later, but not without the help of his trusted sword, Girahim, who I forgot to mention was sentient. Now, Girahim's a bit of a clown, but his plan makes some sense. He wants to steal Princess Zelda's soul to resurrect his master demise, freeing him from his curse of being the imprisoned. Now, this is, of course, because Princess Zelda is the goddess Hylia reborn, so he's sort of figuring that the same magic that put him away should be able to free him. He turns out to be right, because after numerous attempts, he's finally able to free his master demise who has, in my opinion, probably one of the coolest entrances in the entire series. He just kind of shows up in a badass way, and then fucking comments that Zelda used to be hotter when he knew her. Dude rolls up like a total fucking chad. But he is inevitably stomped out by the dynamic duo of Link and the Groose. It's mostly just Link, though, who takes on Demise in the best fight of the entire Skyward Sword game. It's even set in a Nameless King-style arena. Honestly, when I first fought the Nameless King in Dark Souls 3, I immediately thought of this fight with Demise. They have very, very similar atmospheres. So Demise starts fading away, but not before letting Link know some exposition about how his profound hatred will sort of be inherited by someone else and hound the descendants of Link and Zelda for all eternity. Which, yeah, I guess it is a bit on the nose, but, you know, who cares. Demise's hatred wouldn't resurface again for quite some time, not until all the lands of Hyrule and surrounding areas were sort of civilized. Well, for the most part. Now, this is where the extremely strong gene Gerudo come in. They were definitely an interesting race. They were, for the most part, all female, and they lived in the ancient desert. Most of Hyrule viewed them as thieves, but they themselves were, for the most part, a proud warrior society. And sure, they didn't really shy away from banditry, but it's what they were good at. And it's not like stuff would grow in the desert. They really kind of had to steal to survive. Anyway, though, the Gerudo people were led for about 400 years by the ancient Gerudo sisters collectively known as Twinrova. They long prophesied that a male would be born to the Gerudo and he would be their true king and lead them to salvation. Whether or not Demise just lucked out and reincarnated into the only Gerudo male, or that perhaps he was created via some strange ritual with Twin Roba communicating with Demise's, well, essence. But it's not like Ganondorf has any memories of his time as Demise. He truly has kind of reincarnated. We just don't know if it was naturally or artificially. 
Ganondorf was definitely an interesting leader for his people. He saw how they had to struggle to survive in the desert while the people of Hyrule and the surrounding areas sort of thrived in their green utopias or giant lake fortresses or death mountain. All the other races had a place that helped them thrive. The Gerudo, on the other hand, got the barren desert, where thievery was their only prospect, which led to the negative view that the other tribes held towards the Gerudo. Sick of seeing his people suffering just to get by, Ganondorf resolved to bring them a new homeland. But to accomplish that goal, he would need to do a lot of scheming and learn a lot of dark magic from the Twin Rova. So at some point prior to the events of Ocarina of Time, there was some Hyrulean civil war in which presumably all the races participated, as the war ended with their unification. That's why at the beginning of Ocarina of Time, this totally harmless and trustworthy Gerudo monarch shows up to swear allegiance to the King of Hyrule, and the only one to suspect him of foul play or treachery is the little kid Zelda, who manages to convince the young stray forest kid Link to help her move against Ganondorf. Now unfortunately for this dynamic duo, this would set in motion a series of events that would inevitably lead to Ganondorf touching the Triforce and stealing a piece of it. More specifically, the Triforce of Power. And since this effectively made Ganondorf too powerful to be destroyed by conventional means, so the Sages would activate their failsafe, which amounted to sealing away Link for seven years, you know, just long enough for him to be old enough and strong enough to wield the Master Sword. Now during this seven years, Ganondorf was free to reign over Hyrule and its surrounding areas with impunity. It could be said that he went even more mad with this newfound godlike power. He sacked Castletown and filled it with Redeads, which forced all the civilians that survived to relocate to Kikariko Village. Just Dark Lord things. Which, yeah, sure, it's pretty impressive, but it wasn't long before he was inevitably defeated by a time-traveling war orphan who grew up in a forest and was raised by a literal tree. So after several boss fights, Ganondorf was sealed away, finally, and Link was allowed to go back to his own time so that he could live out his childhood which inadvertently leads to him going on another adventure in Termina, effectively saving that land. But even then, his life never really felt fulfilled, which led to him becoming a sort of spectral revenant wolfman until he was able to pass on all his badass skills to a potential successor. I mean, think about it, this Link was probably the most badass Link of all. He whooped Ganondorf's ass when he was still a kid. Sure, he was in his adult body, but it was still his child consciousness. Now, the Temple of Time's wacky time travel shenanigans, such as the unintended side effect of it fracturing the timeline into three distinct paths from Ocarina of Time on. So part of Zelda's plan at the end of Ocarina of Time, when she sent Link back, was that he was supposed to warn her and let everybody know that Ganondorf was all bad, again, as if it wasn't obvious enough. And that basically results in Ganondorf being rounded up and sentenced to execution for plotting against the crown. Since they couldn't punish him for shit he hadn't done yet, such as becoming a Dark Lord who completely destroyed Hyrule, so he was sentenced to execution that was supposed to be carried out by the Sages, and perhaps because he hadn't necessarily done anything wrong yet, the Goddess, presumably Din, blessed him with a Triforce of Power. This was actually the source of confusion for many because where this game fits in the timeline, Ganondorf had never touched the Triforce. That happened later on in Ocarina of Time. So in this instance, he was perhaps given a fair shot by the goddesses, and with that, he took the blade that they were going to execute him with, and he killed one of the sages before they resorted to their Hail Mary of sending him to the Twilight Realm. The sages would later refer to this failed execution as a divine prank on the god's part, which was probably just the only explanation they could come up with. Now, what is the Realm of Twilight? It's basically like a parallel shadow dimension that exists outside of the main one. It's essentially a world of darkness where the only light comes from two quasi-sun-like orbs known as the Souls. So way before the events of the game, there was a tribe of sorcerers. They utilized dark magic in an attempt to take control of the sacred land and steal the divine power of the goddesses, the Triforce itself. These sorcerers were in possession of a very powerful artifact called a Fused Shadow, which very well could have given them the power they needed to seize this land from the goddesses. Unfortunately for them, the Fused Shadow would be shattered into four pieces by the powerful servants of the gods known as the Light Spirits. From there, the goddesses hounded the sorcerers all across Hyrule until they banished them into this parallel dimension. Now, the Twilight Realm has the interesting effect of making the people who dwell within it, well, the ones that dwelled within it for an extended period of time, that is, only being able to appear in the outside world as shadows, and after a while this effect became permanent, effectively locking the interlopers in the shadow realm, where they and their descendants basically just settled the parallel dimension and started their own traditions and cultures, and for lack of a better word, society. And by all accounts, the Twilight Realm was said to be a peaceful place until Ganondorf's banishment there. 
So, uh, nice job, sages. They're fully responsible for what happened to the Twilight Realm and Ganondorf's empowered return. Ganondorf presumably existed in a sort of disembodied, spirit-like state in the Twilight Realm, and it can be believed that he watched the Twilly for many years before deciding to make his move. His chance would come when a certain descendant of those sorcerers, named Zant, who was pretty sad about being passed over, in favor of another more powerful descendant of the sorcerers named Midna. She would later claim that Zant was passed over because the other members of the Twilight Royal Family could see the ambition for power that he possessed and instead chose to not appoint him their ruler, mainly so as to avoid another repeat of their ancestors' folly. It was said that they could see it in his eyes. Or at least that's what Midna said when she's trying to get a rise out of him later on. Anyway, Ganondorf posed as a powerful banished god and would give unto Zant a small fraction of his power. Well, so long as he would carry out Ganondorf's will, which he had no problem doing. So using his newfound power, he would overthrow the Twilight Royal family, including Midna. He would then steal three-fourths of the Fused Shadow, which is an ancient source of their ancestors' dark magic. He would also use this power to turn Midna into an imp and steal most of her magic abilities which would lead her to turn to her own dark magic in the form of the last fused shadow that she still possessed, while giving her the resolve to crush Zant by any means necessary. Zant would then turn all the other residents of the Twilight Realm into vicious, predator-looking monsters that he would then use to act as his army for his conquest of Hyrule. He quickly took the capital with a brutal show of power, forcing Zelda into a surrender and essentially just covering the land, or at least Castletown and some of the surrounding regions, in Twilight. From there, he would send a mercenary group of Bulblins to first crush the Sheikah clan in their hidden village, and then to pollute the light spirits of the surrounding region so that they could be covered in twilight as well. This would end up being Ganondorf and Zant's biggest mistake, especially when, for whatever reason, some of their henchmen, namely King Bulbin, would kidnap a bunch of kids from Ordon Village while he was on his way to pollute the Farron and Ordon Light Springs. This would of course prompt a descendant of the ancient hero of time who happened to be a resident of Ordon to go full Liam Neeson and pursue these attackers into the now twilight-covered region of Farron, where to the absolute shock of Link, he's transformed into a wolf and quickly captured by one of the twilight monsters and dragged back to Castletown to await, well, whatever punishment is coming down in the dungeons. A little did he know, Princess Midna happened to be watching from afar and she happened to know this little secret, or rather legend that her people have, where this great hero would appear as a divine beast when it entered the Shadow Realm, and she saw that and was like, I can use this power to my advantage. I know, I know, there's no way that Xant or Ganondorf could have foreseen this. Perhaps it was another divine prank by the gods. Anyway, the rest is history. You know, Zant would be crushed and Ganondorf would abandon him in his final hour. And after beating his puppet of Zelda and his beast form, Link and Ganondorf settle for one final duel, which is generally customary for these games. How cool is that Sword of the Six Ages, though? As soon as I found out that was available in Breath of the Wild, I went out of my way to collect like three of them, even if it did take forever, because you have to save and then use an amiibo. It's a whole thing. Definitely worth it, though. I mean, just look at it. But before they can come to blows, they have to have a famous meeting of the minds sequence, where Ganondorf mockingly praises Midna's people for having the audacity to oppose the Golden Goddesses with such an insignificant magic, as he puts it. He now holds dominion over both light and dark, and I think his weapon is a good reflection of that. It's a holy divine sword of the Six Sages, but it's used by the literal Dark Lord and it's in a Gerudo-style scabbard. Now, I'm far from any analyst or anything like that, but I really like the symbolism there. He also mentions how they did manage to serve a purpose for him. Their intense and profound anguish and lonesomeness and basically all of their negative emotions were what Ganondorf used to rejuvenate and re-empower himself. Midna and Ganondorf continue to trade hostilities until an outright fight breaks out between the two of them. And Midna hits Ganondorf with a full blast of the combined reforged power of the Fused Shadow, presumably the same thing she shot Zant with. But Ganondorf being Ganondorf manages to brush it off like it's nothing since he possesses both the power of Triforce and the power of Twilight Sorcery or whatever, and then proceeds to crush Midna's cool hat. Link would of course defeat Ganondorf using moves that he learned from his ancestor, the Hero of Time, who after getting to be a hero in Ocarina of Time and being sent back and going through Majora's Mask, he lived through all of that, but then he died unfulfilled. That poor war orphan, but he was finally able to move on after he passed on all his skills to the present Link of Twilight Princess, who would then use those skills to kill Ganondorf. Just very cool stuff all around. Before Ganondorf would die, however, he attempted to call upon the fraction of his power that he had stored away inside Zant in the Twilight Realm. But Zant snaps his own neck in defiance, abandoning Ganondorf in the same way that Ganondorf abandoned him. 
It's a bit poetic that the one who actually finally killed Ganondorf in this timeline was a Twilly. But not only that, it was the main Twilly who he manipulated into doing all this. So, you know, what's funny about it is that he probably never even saw this coming. He probably thought Zant still had full trust in him, even though he never resurrected Zant after his own defeat. Like, he truly probably never even considered that Zant would turn on him. Not because he's stupid or anything. No, above all else, this Ganondorf in particular is arrogant. So arrogant that the sages specifically described this as being what led to his downfall. Don't forget that in this timeline, Ganondorf never got to be a Dark Lord. He never made it that far because, as far as anyone knows in this timeline, he wasn't very secretive about his plots to overthrow the Hyrulean royal family and was thus caught and overthrown. He was quite literally caught because of his profound arrogance. It's like I said when we were covering his actions in Ocarina of Time. He's clearly blatantly evil, everybody else was just refusing to see that, it seemed like. And since this timeline's the one where they went back and warned everybody, now everybody does see him as this evil dude, and like, how could they have even possibly been fooled back then? Now you'd think he'd learn a lesson from this, but he doesn't. Maybe the whole posing as a god thing went to his head. But honestly, I can't really blame this Ganondorf for being so arrogant. I mean, he got caught and sentenced to death by the literal sages, supposedly carrying out the will of the goddess on the land of Hyrule, only for one of those very same goddesses to awaken a divine power within him that allowed him to be saved from his execution, thus sparing him from supposed divine judgment. I think I'd be pretty arrogant after that too. But honestly, that's the best thing about this Ganondorf is just how cocky he is. He's his fully realized, ambitious, unapologetic, power-hungry bandit king self, which is great because it means he doesn't try to justify his actions like he does in the alternative timeline. This Ganondorf has only spite for this world and the only need he possesses is to dominate it, via the controlling of powerful magics and whatnot because he is a dark sorcerer. But this is Ganondorf in his truest form in my opinion, even if he does spend more than half the game behind the scenes. But that's only because he never had any reason or need to take center stage until he does, which is after Zant's killed. I said he was arrogant as all hell, but he's definitely not stupid. And yeah, Zant seemed like a solid puppet, but I mean, look where that got him. I mean, it's the whole reason he gets defeated. People tend to criticize this aspect of Twilight Princess Ganondorf, that he's basically behind the scenes for more than half of the game. But let's look at his actions, you know? He manipulated a desperate man to turn his entire race into monsters and overthrow the rightful heir of his land, just so Ganondorf can use this new army of monsters to invade Hyrule and conquer it. Basically, it does all the work for him, with a Twilly as the figurehead, taking all the blame and diverting any attention from the possibility that Ganondorf might have returned, while also doing irreparable damage to the chances of Hylians and Twilly coexisting. Which, now that I'm thinking about it, is probably why Midna shatters the mirror at the end of the game. Ganondorf was basically Littlefinger in this one, and all of his plotting and scheming is what leads to his inevitable downfall. Because the minute he used Xant to overthrow the Twilight people, that set Midna on a journey to find Link, who would inevitably defeat Ganondorf, this time for good. And you know, that's something I really liked about the narrative of this game. Ganondorf isn't really beat by any last minute wish or anything like that. He's not even fully killed by Link's ending blow. He's killed by Zant, the guy he manipulated to set the whole game into motion. At the end of the day, Ganondorf's fate was sealed the minute those Bulbans rode into Ordon Village and stole those kids. So yeah, Ganondorf meets his end here, and that kind of eradicates him from this timeline so far. But what about the timeline that was created when Link was sent back in time? You know, the ruined world that would have to rebuild from having been under Ganondorf's reign for seven years. And not only that, they would have to get by without a hero now, since theirs had been sent back to his own time. Well first I imagine there would be what I like to call one of Hyrule's famous periods of peace that we never get to experience. So to the great shock and surprise of absolutely no one besides the people of Hyrule, Ganondorf would return. And this time there was no hero to stop. He quickly took over Hyrule using his beast form, and no matter how much the nobles of Hyrule, the royal family, or even the peasants prayed, no hero would come to save him. So in this desperate hour, the king of Hyrule called on the gods to flood the sacred land as a way to seal Ganondorf away from the world. Again, we've seen a few times in the past how this doesn't always seem to work. But yeah, Hyrule would be flooded, it would basically become Atlantis, while also creating the Great Sea, which is the setting of Legend of Zelda Wind Waker. Another game very near and dear to my heart. Basically, the uh, piratey Zelda game, where Twilight Princess was the westerny Zelda game. The survivors of the Great Flood would retreat to the mountains, where the mountaintops would become the many islands that populated the Great Sea. 
Now many years would pass and some cultures would develop, some would change, and some would disappear altogether. For example, not many Gorons seem to have survived the Great Flood, as what few there are are now like wandering merchants in Wood Waker. And the Zora evolved into the Rito, presumably because they couldn't live in salt water. Just like in Twilight Princess though, the Gerudo would disappear entirely. Now I imagine that's just because they're an all-female race and after having to procreate with the other races, there's probably not that many distinctive Gerudo features left around by the events of Wind Waker. Twilight Princess, on the other hand, it seems like maybe they there was some great exodus, maybe, and that Ganondorf just gave the uh, Gerudo Desert to the Bulblins as some sort of like twisted reward for you know polluting all the light spirits. Anyway, I'm getting off subject. The children of the Deku Forest would go on to become the Korok, basically just forest spirits. Basically, a lot of time would pass, and the new environment would change a lot of the surviving cultures. Ganondorf would eventually manage to free himself from his watery imprisonment and set himself up at the aptly named Forsaken Fortress to the far northwest. Once there, he would become a notorious pirate warlord and effectively rebuild his army from the ground up. Full of moblins, bacoblins, and, you know, whiz robes, pretty much everything we're used to from the old, uh, army of Ganon. It was presumably around this time that he would also send two of his more powerful minions to go off the sages Rudo and Fado, rendering the Master Sword effectively useless against Ganondorf should some descendant of the hero ever come along and try to challenge him. I imagine he was pretty happy with himself. Now, in an effort to find the Triforce of Wisdom that the descendant of Zelda possessed, Ganondorf would send one of his henchmen, the Helmrock King, a basically a giant bird, to fly across the Great Sea, kidnapping any girls that he could find with pointed ears, since I guess that's all he had to go on. The Helmorak King would actually successfully capture, albeit briefly, Zelda's descendant Tetra, but her pirate crew was in hot pursuit, so they managed to shoot down, or at least shoot, the Helmorak King, causing him to drop Tetra into some forbidden woods on the quaint little island of Outset, which happened to be one of the few places still around in the Great Sea that held to this old tradition, where when boys of this village would reach a certain age, they were given clothes that resembled that of the ancient hero of time, basically like a coming-of-age rite of passage. Now, either through fate or a divine coincidence, the exact day that Tetra would come fall into those woods happened to be the birthday or the coming of age day of not necessarily Link's descendant, but certainly his successor. But at this point in time, he was just a normal kid. You know, not a care in the world. He liked to practice with the sword and fall asleep up in the watchtower. So this happened to be the exact day he received his green clothes. And whether he knew it or not, he was about to go on one of the greatest adventures of his life. He probably thought he was going to just have to wear those green clothes for one day and then go back to his normal lifestyle. Poor kid. So naturally, when he saw Tetra fall into those woods, he wanted to go see what happened, to go see if he can help her out. And he does, you know, he goes and helps her out of that jam. Sure, she's a little rude about it, but you can tell she's grateful. However, when they're leaving the woods, Link's sister happens to be on the other side of the bridge, probably just waiting to see if he's okay after going into the forbidden woods. When the Helmorok King suddenly comes back and instead of grabbing Tetra, it goes for Link's sister, Aril. This causes Link to ask his grandma for the family shield and to barter passage from the pirates to the Forsaken Fortress, where he covertly enters via cannon. Now, in what I'm almost 99.9% .9 sure is a Metal Gear Solid reference, Link sneaks through the Forsaken Fortress before encountering Ganon himself and getting tossed into the sea where he's luckily rescued by a sentient boat named the King of Red Lions who basically sets him on the right path for his hero's journey. Acts as his guide. You know, all these heroes always have a guide. Skyward Sword Link had five for whatever help she was. Ocarina of Time has Navi. He later gets Tattle and Majora's Mask. And of course, Twilight Princess has Midna. There's always the guide character. But this one happens to be the King of Hyrule in disguise. He also survived the Flood, but more on that later. He takes Link on what can only be described as an odyssey across the Great Sea, gathering pearls, meeting all these new cultures. Before the boy and his boat were able to get the last pearl though, Ganondorf completely destroyed Great Fish Isle in an attempt to either kill or incapacitate Jabon before he could give the duo the last pearl they were seeking and thus gain access to the Tower of Gods and thus return to Hyrule and acquire the Master Sword. You gotta hand it to Ganondorf, I mean he really learned from his lessons in this timeline. Which is why I feel like this depiction is probably one of his best because he constantly remains a couple steps ahead of the player. This whole game is just a really good showing for Ganondorf, but I'm getting off subject. They do end up finding Jabon in the Pearl. Coincidentally, he's hiding out at Link's hometown of Outset Isle. 
The sentient boat eventually takes Link to a trial that he passes in the Tower of Gods, and Link is able to go beneath the waves and claim the Master Sword for himself, and, and from there Link would head back to the Forsaken Fortress to finally challenge Ganondorf again. After destroying one of his phantoms and defeating his henchman the Helmarok King, he finds himself face to face with the ancient Gerudo. However, this time Ganondorf had planned ahead for this one. He had previously ordered the deaths of two sages, the Earth and Wind sages respectively, which caused the Master Sword to lose its ability of banishing evil, as it were. It's effectively just a really nice, sharp object. It can't really, nothing more, nothing less. It can't really banish evil anymore, sorry. Now at this point, Link is basically at Ganondorf's mercy, but before anything can happen, Tetra arrives and causes a diversion for Link, which honestly is a mistake on her part. She should have never gotten involved, or at least never gotten this close to Ganondorf. Because in this instance, he realizes who she is, you know, because the Triforce appears on their hands at the same time. He attempts to seize her, but he's effectively stopped by a group of Link's friends, including the great dragon Valu, who quickly lights Ganon up with fire while Link and Tetra escape. Link and his boat then decide to hide Zelda underneath the waves down in the lost city of Hyrule, while Link searches for the descendants of the two murdered sages. It turns out he's already met them and is their friend, and it turns into this whole second part of the game thing, which in my opinion are the two best dungeons in the game, but that's just me. Link also has to go on this pretty ridiculous scavenger hunt that I won't go on too long of a rant about here, but he has to find 13 pieces of Triforce because, you know, he's not the descendant of the Hero of Courage because this timeline doesn't have one anymore. That hero went back to the timeline that becomes the Twilight Princess timeline and he still had his Triforce and he didn't even know it, so there was effectively no Triforce of Courage here and if, for whatever reason it's split into 13 pieces and it's scattered across the Great Sea. So you'll need to track down 13 charts, and each of these charts you won't be able to read, so you'll have to take them to Tingle who charged you 398 rupees per decipher, and you have to do this 13 times, I believe, until you found all pieces of Triforce, then you can return to Hyrule, only to find out that while you're on this wild goose chase, Ganon has in fact captured Zelda, and has reconsolidated all of his power at his Fortress of Evil, located underneath the waves where you thought it was safe. Personally, I blame the boat. This seemed like it was all his idea. Link is kind of just along for the ride. But naturally, Link fights his way through Ganon's Shadow Tower and ends up having to fight all of the bosses he previously fought, I think except for the Tower of Gods one, before having to fight another Phantom Ganon and then a Puppet Ganon, and then he finally gets to have his grand showdown with Ganondorf on the top of the Ganon Tower. Very cool stuff. Here Ganondorf sort of kind of tries to recontextualize his reasoning behind what he did. He talks about how he saw the wind only bringing suffering for his people who had to live in the desert of all places while it brought peace and prosperity to the people of Hyrule. He felt envious of that wind, that he became this necessary evil so that he could bring prosperity to his people. And sure, that's all well and good. Maybe those were his intentions at the start. But it is worth noting that during the seven years that this Ganondorf, this same Ganondorf was in charge, the Gerudo people were not uplifted at all. In fact, the only other important Gerudo besides Ganondorf and Twin Rova, Niboru actively despised and was in opposition to Ganondorf's ideals and goals. Shit, she planned to infiltrate his ranks and turn as many of the Gerudo against him as she could. That of course did not work out and she was discovered by the Twin Rova sisters and was promptly brainwashed with some kind of magical trance and used to do the exact opposite of what she set out to do. It was said that she ran around brainwashing others into Ganon's cause. Truly a cruel fate for her if you ask me. Now Twin Rova would eventually stick her inside an Iron Knuckles costume and make her fight against Link. This would of course be seven years after their previous encounter, but yeah, she's not a fan of Ganondorf and I'd say that she speaks for the majority of the Gerudo people. And look, they got dark witches brainwashing their own people to serve in his army. I just don't think that would have been necessary if he had truly been uh, doing all of this for his people, you know, if he had actually uplifted them and given them some kind of status after he was in charge. He didn't do that though, he actually did the opposite and treated them like shit. So I imagine he didn't give two shits about his people and he's just sort of having a retconned memory of things. Like in his mind he saw himself as doing all this for good, but he was actually wasn't. You know what I mean? Maybe like I said, maybe he started with good intentions, but we see that he didn't do shit for his people, so. I think it's actually very clear too that the only Gerudo he cared about was Twin Rova because on the two swords he busts out to fight Link on the top of the Shadow Tower, each one is engraved with the individual names of Twin Rova. Koume and Kotake, I believe, and I'm hoping I didn't butcher those, but I probably did. 
See guys, Ganondorf cared about his mom. Doesn't that make him so compelling and sympathetic? Isn't he just, like many mass murderers, misunderstood? I just, I see a lot of videos calling him tragic, and I may have even called him kind of tragic in the past because it's not like he asked to uh, reincarnate with an ancient hatred inside him. He claims he wants to help his people, but we never actually see any of that once he takes power. In fact, if the Gerudo happen to still be around in whatever timeline he's uh, causing mischief in, they usually oppose him. Shit, I always saw that crew of Gerudo pirates in Majora's Mask as sort of like the aftermath for the Gerudo of Ganondorf's failed coup because in the timeline that game takes place, you know, he was exposed and caught almost immediately because of the time traveling war orphan and his ninja buddy. So I kind of always saw them having fled to Termina and not being present in the subsequent games as being like the result of his actions. Or I guess rather the consequences, but that's just my own headcanon though, felt like worth mentioning. So at the last second when the king shows up and calls upon the gods to once again flood Hyrule, Ganondorf found himself faced with the revelation that the king was more than willing to let Hyrule and therefore the Triforce be destroyed if it also meant that Ganondorf was gone too, you know, for good. Faced with this, all the old Gerudo can do is laugh and resign himself to his fate. Now I gotta admit, it's pretty fucked that despite being constantly one step ahead of this boat king, he still ends up having his wish stolen from him in the end. I mean, Ganondorf basically won in this game. He had all three pieces of the Triforce. He disarmed Link and incapacitated Zelda. He was literally about to make his wish. And then at the very last second, that win is ripped from his hands. I think I'd probably laugh in this situation too. You can't really be mad because your fate's already sealed, but you can at least attempt to take them with you. At least that's how I imagine Ganondorf saw it. At least give him one last good fight. <laughs> but yeah, his two little katana pirate blades are actually engraved with the twin row of his names. Very cool. Anyway though, after their little discussion, Link and him engage in a very brutal and very cinematic sword fight. Link is aided in battle by Zelda who's using his bow and the light arrows that he literally just got. But they fight for an extended period of time until Link finally sees an opening and drives the Master Sword right into Ganon's forehead, shattering his ornate little head jewel in the process. Now because he's Ganondorf, he gets to monologue for a little bit longer, but unlike his uh, other timeline equivalent in Twilight Princess, this Ganondorf seems to accept his fate as he turns to stone. And he dies along with all of old Hyrule, including the King of Red Lions. The good old Boat King uses the last of his power to create this like little breathable air bubble for Zelda and Link to escape through, while he resigns himself to his fate as he waits with Ganondorf's solidified corpse as the waters of the heavens pour down upon them. Some very cool stuff. Now there's also another timeline that I like to see as more of like a what if kind of thing and that's the dark timeline. Or actually I mean the downfall timeline, much cooler name. But it's where Link is defeated by Ganondorf in Ocarina of Time and this leads to uh, most of the 2D games. Those are all more reincarnations of Ganon, his beast pig form and not really Ganondorf. But we definitely will get to covering those at some point. Now there's also Ganondorf's very recent appearance. In the hit sequel to 2017's Breath of the Wild, Tears of the Kingdom, a little indie game you may or may not have heard of. Now because we don't exactly know where in the timeline those games are, I'd say um, I kind of believe the theory that like it doesn't really matter, it just happens so far down the timeline that it could have happened in any of the three. But that Ganondorf, I think, in my opinion at least, deserves his own video and we will get to him shortly. And by shortly I mean as soon as I'm able to get those clips off of my Switch. But as always, I hope you guys found this video to be somewhat enjoyable and somewhat informative. And if you liked it, please like it. If you disliked it, please dislike it. And if you like hearing me ramble about video game characters and the occasional movie or TV show or lore or whatever the fuck, please consider subscribing. We've got a lot of good stuff coming this year. I'm finally going to get to Fallout lore eventually and some Elder Scrolls stuff. And of course, classic Dark Souls trilogy stuff. We're going to get to it all. But before we get to our final thoughts, let's uh, let's have our outro, shall we? So I tried to structure this video around those three Ganondorfs all being the same guy. The one in Twilight Princess and Wind Waker are effectively both possible outcomes of what happens in Ocarina of Time. I don't even think I have enough footage to cover the, uh, the current new Ganondorf, but he is great, isn't he? He looks like a goddamn Sekiro boss. I like that they got um, Jotaro and Majima's English voice actor to be him too, that's a nice touch. 
But yeah, man, I've been playing the shit out of that Legend of Zelda game, and I really want to talk for hours about the depths, but I have no footage to use. Well, until I acquire myself one of them capture card things that I just found out about. So once all that's sorted, expect some Tears of the Kingdom content. I'm undoubtedly going to be late to the party on that one, but then again, I didn't start making Elden Ring videos until like two or three months after the game had been out, so it's very true to the spirit of Honored Madman in my opinion. Anyway though, let me know what you guys thought about the video in the comments. Who's your favorite Zelda? Who's your favorite Ganondorf? And more importantly, who's your favorite Link? Let me know in the comments. I'll see you next time. It should be Radagon Science Project time soon. So be on the lookout for that. Sorry about those uh, constant delays on that video. I know I've been kind of hyping it up. But it'll be done soon, I promise. It's literally the top of my list. But as always, you guys have a good one and I will see you next time. Huh? <laughs>